Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I have put my contact information down here on the bottom, Linda at wildwoodsproject.org, and our website uh, as well, and that's going to also be in the chat. I invite you to visit our website to learn more details about what I'm going to tell you tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a new project, uh, the, uh, actually a new organization that I founded called Wild Woods Restoration Project. Um, and I'll start by talking about why we're doing this. So the first thing is, for those of you that aren't in the Northeast, um, this is a view of what many of our forests look like in the Northeast. Um, and for those of you that are in the Northeast, you're be, you'll be familiar with this. Uh, if your forest doesn't look like this, um, congratulations. <laughs> Um, what we're looking at here is not a healthy forest. Uh, yes, there's a lot of trees, uh, but there is, there's a lot of layers missing in this forest. Uh, we have virtually nothing in the, the understory here. And why is that? Uh, well, there's several different impacts that happen with our forests. Um, we have major problems with overpopulation of deer. Uh, that are eating everything in the forest understory. We also have past land use. Most of our forests were clear cut at one point, um, and many of them have been farms that have grown back into forests. So the severity of the impact uh, influences how the forest came back. Um, and I'll, I'll I can talk a little bit about that too. Um, if the forest has been clear cut and then it's allowed to regenerate on its own, oftentimes those pioneer tree species that come in grow up very fast and shade the ground. And that results in the understory not being able to get established. Those shrubs and herbaceous uh, plants that would normally be there are shaded before they can get started. If it was farmed, the plants or the root source or the, um, the seed bank for those plants that would come back may have been uh, obliterated by the farming. Uh, the, soil has, the soil layers have been changed. Uh, so that can also result in this, uh, this sort of look of the forest when you see it like that. Um, the other thing that can happen is invasive species. Uh, both insects and plants. And normally, if there are invasive species uh, as plants, they would be filling that forest understory. We may end up with a forest understory that looks like this if the invasive species have been removed um, because there is not always a seed source for the native plants to come back after the invasive species have been removed. Um, we also have pests and disease which may have affected some of the plants that would normally be in that area. But the primary reasons are deer and past land use. Uh, that's why our forests look like that. Forests should look like this. Uh, a healthy forest has a mid-story with smaller trees, trees that normally don't grow into the canopy, um, younger trees, of uh, younger individuals of the canopy species, a shrub layer uh, with a bunch of with uh, shrubs down here. There's also an herbaceous layer. There's mosses, lichens. There's a nice litter layer. There's fungi. Uh, so there's a lot of layers that would normally be in the forest. And when those are missing, not only are we missing vegetation, we're missing habitat. We're missing a whole vertical structure of habitat. Uh, there's birds that nest on the forest floor that have nowhere to take cover, um, so they can't establish there. Uh, we have a, a three-dimensional uh, landscape where spiders can have their webs and uh, other insects can, can survive. Uh, not to mention that we're missing a lot of biodiversity. 
Um, Because if you go out into the forest and you look at what species are there, there are tree species, but you know, you're normally looking at maybe a half a dozen, a dozen tree species. Most of the diversity in the forest is in the understory, the shrubs and the herbaceous layer. So we're missing a lot of diversity by not having that. So that's what we saw and that's what we wanted to try to address. So how do we get those forests back? Well, first we have to control deer and I'm not gonna be talking about that tonight. That's a whole other talk. Um, next, we have to remove invasives. Again, that is a whole effort in and of itself. But we suppose we do that and we sit back and watch. Is it gonna come back? Maybe if we're lucky, it would come back. But in most cases, especially where we're at in New Jersey and New York, we don't have the seed sources of the natives to come back and colonize those areas. We have to actively manage the forest to get it back. Um, so the mission of Wildwoods Restoration Project is we are going to help restore the health and diversity of our Hudson Valley forests with local native plants grown by volunteers. And in doing so, we're gonna inspire a passion for continued stewardship of those areas. So we're partnering with parks. We're supporting parks efforts to restore their woods. Um, this is us meeting with some of the biologists at Farnstock State Park in Putnam County, New York. Uh, planting at Black Rock Forest in Orange County, New York, meeting with land managers at Granite Mountain uh, in Putnam County, New York. Uh, so we work with them. Uh, we work with them to support their efforts. We all know that parks are facing funding gaps, decreased funding. They can't even do basic vegetation management that they might want to do. So when they are able, to do things like remove invasives or control deer, we wanna come in and support the restoration. And by supporting that restoration, it enables the restoration to happen. So those areas are less likely to get reinvaded with invasives. Um, and so in order to work with us, the parks have to already have put some skin in the game. They've already got to have some work being done. And whether that's done by park employees or by volunteers, uh, that, that is um, you know, up to them. Uh, but then we wanna support that and come in and help allow them to go that, that next extra step to get it to restoration. So the restoration principles that we're using is we're using local ecotype native seeds and I'll explain what ecotype means. Um, so we're look, looking to be as local as possible to preserve the genetics of the local species. Uh, we work to understand the natural community that is already there, um, looking to put the right plant in the right place. And then we are planning uh, for monitoring our results and adapting our restoration. And we have done um, every restoration site that we do, we go in and we do free data collection so that we know what was there and, uh, and the percentages of it. Uh, so that after we do our restoration work, we can monitor uh, the success of what we've done. So what does local ecotype mean? Um, a population is adapted to local environmental conditions. Uh, so the implication is that those individuals that were best adapted to those conditions left the most offspring and they are going to be able to best establish and survive and handle the local conditions. And this is one sort of poster child that I like to talk about. This is a red maple. Um, the map here is the range of red maples. Um, and we all know the climatic differences of, between Florida and Maine. If I take a red maple, from Florida and plant it up in Maine is probably not going to do 
as well as if I took a red maple from Maine and planted it in Maine. Um, that's because the red maple from Florida is used to much different climatic conditions and also probably different uh, geography, geology, sorry, and soil conditions and soil chemicals and nutrients. So uh, the, the idea is by focusing on your local ecotype, you're gonna have the best success for the conditions that you're planting in. The other reason we're, we're focusing on local ecotype is we have a lot of development pressure in the New York City metropolitan region, which is where we operate. Um, and we're losing a lot of our genetic diversity. Uh, so by focusing on local ecotype, we are able to preserve and spread that local genetics to make sure that we, we've still got it, that we haven't lost that gene pool. Genetic variability is also something that allows the populations to survive and adapt to changing conditions. So we want to make sure that we're, we're preserving as much genetic variability as possible. Um, so we also look at the USDA hardiness zones. So we are here, located right about here, northern New Jersey, southern Hudson Valley, New York, right around New York City. And that's primarily um, the uh, hardiness zone, zone six, A and B. Uh, the green area. Uh, so the hardiness zone tells us what the climate is, the growing, the growing degree days, the coldest temperatures, um, and that, that controls what some of the species are that can survive in our areas. Um, so for example, there may be some species that are from the south that don't really you know, survive up in uh, our area because of the cold winters. Um, we, and vice versa from the north may not survive because of the heat uh, during the summer. So um, we, we also want to focus on making sure that we are keeping within our hardiness zones. And I know a lot of you are thinking about climate change. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, the EPA has defined ecoregions. Uh, so ecoregions are based on the um, geography and the soil conditions. Uh, they're not necessarily based on the, uh, the climate. Uh, so what we're looking at here are what is the bedrock and how did that affect the nutrients and chemistry of the soil? And that then also affects what the community of plant species are that is found in that ecoregion. So in our area, um, we have ecoregion 58, which is the Northern Highlands. And that goes from you know, uh, Western Maine all the way down into Central uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, we have ecoregion 59, which is the Northeastern Coastal Zone. It goes from Southern Maine all the way down to Staten Island, Long Island. Um, we have also Ecoregion 67, which is the Ridge and Valley. That includes uh, Appalachians. Um, that starts in Western Orange County, New York and Ulster County and goes through a sliver of Northwest New Jersey and through Pennsylvania down into the Northern Virginia. Um, and we have Ecoregion 64, which is the Northern Piedmont, goes from Rockland County, New York, through North Central New Jersey and down into Pennsylvania and Maryland. So we're operating right here in this, this region. Um, and if we were to overlay the hardiness zones on this, we would see that really we are we are working right in this region. Even though even though the eco region goes all the way up into Maine, that's a different hardiness zone. Um, so we want to be really local in what we're doing. 
And the plant assemblages that come out of those two combinations, the ecoregions and the hardiness zones, are defined uh, in uh, documents, you know, the, the natural heritage programs of each state has defined the, the communities that are found in those states. You can find the ecological communities of New York. Uh, and we have the links, uh, they're gonna go in the chat. I don't know if they've been uh, put up yet. Um, there you go. Uh, and so you guys can find what the ecological communities are where you're at in New York and New Jersey uh, from these locations. And if you're not in New York or New Jersey, just look at your state's natural heritage program, and I'm sure they will have the ecological communities defined. Okay, so we also practice responsible seed collection. Um, our seed collection protocols are modeled after the Bureau of Land Management Seeds of Success Protocol. Um, that protocol requires that we find substantial populations that are healthy uh, to collect from. We don't wanna be collecting from like one or two individuals. We don't wanna be collecting from sick populations or diseased populations. Um, and that we also then obtain permission from the landowner to collect the seed. We collect no more than 20% of the available seed. That's an upper limit. Typically we're collecting much less than that. Um, and we do not want to exceed that because we want to leave enough seed for the population to remain viable, for that seed to you know, regenerate within the population, and also enough seed for the wildlife that's out there that might use that seed. So no more than 20%. And like I said, very often we're much, much less than that. Um, we collect from individuals throughout the population. So we spread our collection through. Um, so we're getting the edges, we're getting the center, we're getting sort of a, a wide uh, range of individuals from that population. Uh, and that way we can best ensure that we're getting the genetic diversity that's represented. The other thing that has to be done is if this is a species that has seed ripening, that is throughout a longer period of time, like maybe some of it ripens at the beginning of the month, and then some of it ripens at the end of the month, and some of it ripens a month later. We have to go multiple times to collect some of that seed so that we're getting the full range of ripening diversity from that plant. So we're, we're preserving those genetics as well. Um, so the Bureau of Land Management Seeds of Success Program is uh, you can find more about that at this URL here. So the other thing we do is we keep the provenance of all of the seed that we collect. We keep a GPS coordinate and we keep associated with that seed and with the plants that we're growing where that seed came from so that we can ensure that it's going into an appropriate location. Um, and if land managers or people that are doing restoration want specific uh, habitats or location, seed that comes from specific habitats or locations, we know where our seed came from and we can provide that. Uh, so we provide, uh, we keep the provenance and provenance is basically the place of origin uh, or the history of ownership. So we track that throughout the growing of the plants as well. The label on our plants has that information as it goes through being grown. Um, so we also store our excess seeds at, in appropriate conditions at a seed bank. Um, there are regional seed banks, mostly funded by the federal government. And if you're in the West, Western US, um, they're very well developed there. Um, our seed bank that we are using is the Mid-Atlantic Seed Bank. It's located in Staten Island, New York, and it serves the Mid-Atlantic states. Um, and so this is a picture of it. I visited it and say hi to my seeds. Um, so it's climate controlled and uh, we can be sure that our seeds are stored as in as 
um, appropriate and controlled conditions as possible to give them the most likelihood of staying viable. Um, but I want to caution everybody. Some seeds can't be stored. Some species cannot, you cannot store the seeds. These are called recalcitrant seeds. Um, some examples, many wetland plants, for example, willows, uh, you can't store those seeds. They're expecting to be, to be um, wet when they fall from the plants. And um, if they dry out, they, they, they lose viability. Um, some spring ephemerals, for example, bloodroots, they don't so, uh, they're expecting to get planted right away in nature and they don't do well if they get dried out. Um, oaks and hickories and maples also uh, fall into this category. Now, how do you know? I have a, a URL here for you. Plants from Seed uh, is a great database. There, uh, there are some other databases as well, but this is a great one to look at uh, to see if the seeds or the species that you're expecting to grow um, you know, can be stored what their growing conditions are, how much seed stratification they need, et cetera. Um, so I, I recommend that one. So the other thing that we're doing um, is, you know, if you can't store the seed, well, you need then sort of a living seed source. And what we can do for that is we can create founder or foundation plots. Uh, some people are starting to call these seed increase plots. Um, so these are essentially planted beds of ecotype plants, all the same ecotype, um, to be tended and used as living seed sources. Um, this is a picture of the foundation plots at Greenbelt Native Plant Center in Long Island. Um, and you know there are different ways to do this. They, this is one of the ways they do the planting with landscape fabric in between. Uh, to keep it, the weeds out so it's it's easier to make sure when you harvest you're getting pure seed from that particular species. Um, there are all kinds of protocols about doing founder plots but it is that idea and the way of doing it is in its infancy so a lot of experimentation is happening and a lot more scientific research needs to be done to understand by species, what is the best way to do founder plots? Um, so as a volunteer for our organization, you can help us scout for populations to collect seed from. So we're looking for populations that are accessible in forests. Um, the reason we're looking for something that's accessible because you have to usually go back multiple times to that population to catch it when the seeds are ripe. So you find it while it's flowering. Uh, oh, great, it's flowering well. So we, that means we should be able to expect to collect a good a number of seed from it. But now you have to keep going back until you can find that it, you know, the seed is uh, ready. Maybe if it's that variable germany, or I mean variable ripening of seed, you have to go back multiple times to collect as well. We want to make sure the population is of good size that it's healthy, that it's reproducing, that means that it's either got a good number of flowers or it's got a good number of seeds. We ask our volunteers to take a photo of the plant and of the population and use inaturalist.org to post it. Uh, we have a project on iNaturalist called Wildwoods Restoration Populations. Uh, so you can join that project and submit your ob observations to the project. Anybody can help us do this. Um, and so I, I would encourage you, if you're in our region, uh, to go on to inaturalist.org, create your account, join the project, download the app, and get ready uh, so that next time you're out hiking in the woods uh, and you see something that might be appropriate for collection, you can report it to us. Now, just because it's reported doesn't mean we're going to collect seed from it. Um, we have to get landowner permission. And uh, it has to be a, a population that we can store the seed of. And it has to be something that we anticipate using. Um, you know, we may not collect something if we have, we can't see that we would be using it in the near future. Uh, we do the seed collection. 
And then we organize the volunteers to grow plants from locally collected seed. So the volunteers are involved in collecting. Um, volunteers must be trained and vetted and they have to be uh, willing to do the data collection that we are requiring when we do a collection. So this is a smaller set of volunteers that are doing collection. Um, and then they help us sow seed. We have volunteer work days where we sow seed. We teach volunteers about different types of seed and how to do seed cleaning. And then we do some seed sowing for the next year. Um, our volunteers also help us pot up seedlings. We have volunteer work days, groups uh, uh, where we get together in late May, early June to pot up seedlings. And we are mobile. We take our, um, our work day to our partner sites. So the partner uh, can invite their own volunteers, local volunteers to come and help pot up and take plants home and grow plants for their local preserve. Um, and this is an example of how we do that. We have the bins of soil. Um, we have uh, our seedlings that get separated out and potted up in these little two and a half inch pots. That's two and a half inch by, uh, measured across the side. And those go into a tray of 32. And then after the potting up workday, volunteers can take home a flat of potted up seedlings to grow at home. And we don't require that you attend a potting up work day in order to take home a flat of seedlings to grow. Uh, we will meet you at the parking lot of the local big box store and give you a flat to take home and grow. Um, so we did that last year uh, for some of our New Jersey volunteers. We didn't have any potting up work days in New Jersey. Um, but we met about six volunteers uh, and got them their flats to, to grow. And then we went back in uh, September when they brought them back and picked them up. Um, so yeah, we will, we will enable that if you'd like to participate, but you can't make it to a potting up work day. Um, so we have our events throughout the lower Hudson Valley. Um, and then the volunteers grow the plants at home. And that's typically from June-ish until September, and then they bring them back. Um, and if you are a new volunteer or you're inexperienced growing, you maybe just get one plant. That's the size of a flat. Um, if you're an experienced grower, you may get a couple of flats or a lot of flats. Um, and by and large, we had, uh, I think a little over 30 growers this year, which is, by the way, this year was our first year, last uh, 2022 um, was our first year, and all of our growers were really successful. It was really, um, really great. Uh, they, they all had better than 80% success rate, and um, which is really, really an accomplishment because we had a severe two month long drought. And a lot of people were under water restrictions um, and they were able to keep their plants alive, uh, watering every day and sometimes twice a day. Uh, and they, they did a great job. So the other cool thing about this is distributed growing, right? So we don't have a central facility. We don't have a greenhouse that we're growing stuff. We don't have a farm is distributed among all of our volunteers and we can grow as many plants as we have volunteers. Uh, we are not limited by space. Um, the other cool thing about this is when our volunteers are taking care of their plants, they get attached to them. They are invested in their success. They want to see those plants succeed. And that is part of inspiring our volunteers. Um, the other nice thing that we do is we reward our volunteers for successfully growing their plants by letting them earn a percentage of the plants that they grow or you know, a, a, an equal percentage of a different species. Uh, so if they grow this flat of 32 plants, they earn six plants 
that's a 20% rule. And they can get either the uh, plants they grew or plants that we've grown specifically for our volunteers. We know that most of what we're growing for our restoration projects is for forest understory. And our volunteers might not have appropriate conditions for that. So we grow a variety of pollinator plants uh, that they can also select from for their reward plants. So we also have volunteer workdays in the fall to plant our plants in restoration projects. Uh, we have sites in local parks and preserves and our work days are in September and October. And we use a bulb auger planter. So it's like a, a little screw um, auger that is used to plant these small plants. Um, anybody can do this. This little boy here is six years old. He was able to do this. Uh, so we have um, a wide variety of people that are able to participate. Doesn't really take much effort. You don't have to be digging a huge hole. Um, it's really easy and we're able to get a lot of plants in the ground in a work day. We, our work days are about two hours long. We were able to get around 600 plants in the ground at, at um, some of our work days. Uh, this is our planting crew in the Bronx along the old Croton Aqueduct. And uh, these two uh, groups are, are, these two photos are pictures from Black Rock Forest planting days. So how about some accomplishments? Uh, I'll throw some numbers at you. Uh, in 2022 was our first year. Um, we had 65 volunteers who donated uh, 1,200 volunteer hours, and there's the, the dollar equivalent of those volunteer hours that they donated. Uh, we grew 3,300, almost 3,400 plants, and we got 1,700 of them in the ground at five different restoration sites. Now, why didn't we get all of them in the ground? Well, we purposely held back some uh, because we wanted them to grow them bigger for next year. Uh, and we also planted some of those, I didn't count those in the, the plants planted, but we planted some of those in founder plots so that we'll have seed sources for next year. And some of those plants were also given to volunteers as their reward plants. Um, so we, uh, we purposely uh, did not plant the rest for those reasons. Uh, this year, we made 136 seed collections of 78 different species across all four of the ecoregions in our area. One thing I wanted to mention about the species that we're collecting, um, we are making sure not to ignore the inconspicuous species. Uh, we had collected things like jump seed and uh, lop seed. Uh, that have very tiny little flowers uh, and normally are not sold in commercial nurseries because they're not showy. Uh, we also collected um, wild lettuce, which is normally considered a weed, um, but has ecological value. And it has a role to play in forest gaps. Uh, so we are making sure not to ignore those inconspicuous species that aren't really sold in nurseries. We partnered in 2022 with Black Rock Forest. Uh, we partnered with Hudson Highlands Land Trust, New York State Parks uh, in Westchester County and in the Bronx. And we um, partnered with, with Westchester County Parks for Graham Hills Park, we supplied plants to them for a corporate planting workday. Um, and I should mention, we do not require our partners to pay anything. Uh, we support them for free. So how are, how are we doing? Um, we, have, uh, we did a volunteer survey in January um, and we found that 98% of our volunteers were inspired to continue stewardship. Um, 97 of them would vo volunteer again. 
And 91% felt like they had made a difference in that just that one year. They really felt like, like they had. And I feel like these numbers are fabulous. I, I told my board, I feel like we got a blue ribbon and it's going to be a really high bar to keep meeting, um, but we think we can do it. Um, so the other thing we do is we do plant rescues uh, with permission from the property owner, uh, the area, if the area is designated for development or other impact. Uh, we did one plant rescue uh, where we rescued 130 plants and those are the, some of the species uh, that we rescued, uh, mostly Jack in the pulpit, uh, but also some of these other uh, species as well. Um, so some current open questions. Uh, some of these questions might have already occurred to some of you and I haven't seen the Q&A so I didn't see if those came in, but there's this concept called seed transfer zones. And the idea is how far can or should a seed be moved? Um, so far, we've decided to stay within the hardiness zone within our eco region. But, you know, uh, birds can eat a, a fruit and fly a long distance and poop that fruit out they can move it a long distance. Plants that are blown by the wind can blow a long way. Um, there's a lot of science and research that needs to be done that is not out there about how far we really can move these seeds without having a negative effect. Um, the reason you would not want to move a seed uh, is because of that whole idea of, of ecotype and adaptation to the local uh, conditions. So you want to avoid it being maladapted to wherever you're moving it to. But you also want to preserve the natural genetic pattern of the species. And if you move genetics into an area of that same species, but a different population, and the genetics you put in were not already in that population, and it ends up taking over that population, you can lose some of the genetics that were in the original population. So that there's, this is a very complicated biological question that there's just not a lot of information about. So this is a current open question. Um, the other question is preserving genetic diversity. How do we, when we're <laughs> growing plants, how do we make sure that we preserve the genetic diversity? Um, I talked a little bit about the variable bloom and seed set of plants. Um, if we only collect at one point from a population, we may be only collecting the seeds that are ripe right then, and some might ripen later. Um, we also, as, as we're growing seeds, and we are potting up little seedlings that germinate in the first year, there are probably seeds still in that soil that would germinate in two years or three years. How do we make sure to, to preserve that variability in the germination timing? We don't want to lose that. That can be the difference between a population getting wiped out by a drought in one year and a population being, to being able to survive because there were seeds still in the soil that could germinate the next year or the year after. Um, so we need to figure out our methods to make sure that we're not unconsciously selecting for those ones that germinate and grow in one year or the ones that, that um, set seed in September or whatever. So we have to be very careful about that. Handling rare and endangered and threatened species. Um, my organization, we've made the conscious decision that we're not going to collect and we're not going to grow rare, threatened, endangered species. Uh, we do have the knowledge and capability to do that. And if we do get a, a specific request from a park manager, uh, we can discuss that with them. But, um, you know, this is a a really fraught question because 
some of these species are rare in our area, but they're common in other states. And they may be even common in the nursery trade. And people are buying those plants and seeds from elsewhere and planting them anyway. So that can actually cause genetic uh, drift or swamping of our local ecotype, uh, rare and endangered species. So this is an open question. How do we handle this? Um, what should we do? And there's not agreement among the scientists about how to do this. Um, so something that we're dealing with. How to be more sustainable with potting soils. Right now we're using potting soil that has a lot of peat in it. We don't wanna be doing that, um, but there aren't good solutions. Um, you know, there are things with, uh, you can cut the soil you're using with, by adding uh, coconut core or rice hulls or, um, you know, using wood chips or things like that. So we, this is something that we're continuing to investigate and continuing to experiment with. I know a lot of people are struggling with this right now uh, as well. So where do we work? Uh, let's look at it more a little bit specific here. Um, so these are, this red circle sort of circumscribes the general area we work in. Um, these are the counties we work in, or Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess. Uh, this is Ulster County, Orange, Rockland. Uh, so that's New York. Um, New York City is right down here. Um, and then this is Northern New Jersey. Uh, so we work in Bergen, Essex Union, Passaic, Morris, Sussex, okay. And there's four different ecoregions, which I talked about before. Um, so right now our current partners are all in New York, uh, but we are working to make sure that we're covering this whole area. Uh, and this map is based on the EPA level three ecoregions by Omernick. So here's again, the look of the, the ecoregions. So you'll see, we I, I was describing, we work right here, but our ecoregions go to various lengths in Pennsylvania and, and Massachusetts and, and even up to Maine. Um, so one of the discussions we've been having with relation to climate change you know, should we be collecting seed from down here and bringing it up into our area? You know, bring a little bit, maybe a little bit further south, same eco region, but just, you know, to give those, those ecotypes that are a little bit more adapted to the warmer region a chance to establish in our area to, to make those communities a little bit more, um, you know, invulnerable to climate change. We, ha we have not made a decision to do that, but that's again, another one of the open questions. So for 2023, what are some of the projects we have? Uh, well, when we take on a partner, we do not take them on for just one year. We take them on for multiple years. So we're gonna be continuing with Black Rock Forest, Granite Mountain, uh, and Putnam County, and our, our new partner for 2023 is Pound Ridge Land Conservancy, which is in Westchester County. Um, also a really exciting project with the New York State Parks and Farnstock State Park. We are going to be providing plants for restoration plantings in New England cottontail habitat, uh, which is a species of special concern um, right now. And it's sort of known as a, a forest uh, rabbit. It uses the forest for cover, um, but then it uses nearby fields for forage. And right now, the area that it exists in Farnstock State Park, the forest understory is primarily Japanese barberry. And the park manager would love to get rid of that, but the cottontail is using that for cover. Uh, the problem is the cottontail is negatively impacted by that because they end up with heavy tick loads uh, because they're under the barberry, which is uh, facilitating the tick populations. So what they've done is they've um, removed barberry from a couple of patches, and we're going to be uh, establishing native 
habitat in those patches fenced in at first until that establishes. And then they're gonna remove the fence and study the New England cottontail usage of that area. And if it's successful, then they're going to remove more barberry and we're gonna do more restoration. So we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. And then we're also going to be partnering for the Old Crone Aqueduct. This is a long linear park that goes through a lot of residential areas um, in Westchester and the Bronx. Those are uh, the two counties that we're gonna be working in. We're also in discussion with partners in New Jersey. So we're hoping that we may have some partners uh, coming on board in New Jersey. And the timeline for this, so for the new partners, uh, because these are new partners, the first year is going to be primarily seed collection and then starting to grow those plants for next year, for 2024, or even for further out. Um, so that's, that's sort of the timeline of how things would work. So you guys can all be involved. You can all help restore the forest. And I love this quote by Lily Tomlin, uh, and I, I hope that's really from her because I got that from the internet. Uh, she said, I said, somebody should do something about that. And then I realized that I am somebody. You know, we are the ones, if we want to see something done, we're the ones that need to do it. Do it. And um, I also put on here at the bottom, everybody can be involved in our organization. There are no physical limits, uh, limitations for people to be involved. Uh, as I mentioned, I might, I, I think I forgot to mention, uh, our growers, we had growers that lived in apartments that grew their flat on their balconies. Uh, we had growers from uh, teenage kids to uh, elderly retirees uh, that grew plants for us. And I put this quote on the bottom here from one of our volunteers. I look forward to contributing next year, living with a disability I don't always get to feel like I'm making a difference. So I really love this experience. Um, so very, everybody can participate. Um, so how can you help? Uh, well, if you would like to be one of our volunteers, sign up for our monthly newsletter. Uh, it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash subscribe WWRP. And that is case sensitive. I just found that out. WWRP has to be capital. Uh, so subscribe to our monthly newsletter. You'll find out when we're having the events and you can sign up. Um, if you're not local and you can't volunteer, you can still subscribe to our newsletter. But hey, think about donating uh, to help us. Uh, we're a brand new organization. We do need funding. We're not asking the parks to pay for what we do. Uh, all of our supplies are provided to our volunteers. So, you know, maybe just a a small donation would be really helpful. Uh, you'll find the donate link on our website and you can donate right now. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook um, and you'll know, find out about some of the other stuff that's going on. And then importantly, share our information with other folks. Um, we wanna broaden our network. We want people to know about us. Anybody that you think would be interested in volunteering let them know about it and let them subscribe to our, our newsletter and, and follow us and, and uh, let, you know, join our, our group. Uh, so before I close, I just want to thank Gisela and Wild Ones for inviting me to present and tell you all about what we're doing. I really appreciate the, the forum and the opportunity. So thank you. Uh, uh, Sarah, you're muted. Yes, I am muted. I'm sorry about that. That was a very, very fantastic presentation. And it was, it had a lot of new and unique information that we don't typically see. Um, for example, you went into ecoregions and provenance, so like the history of the origin of the seeds, how you went out there with the, you know, and track the GPS location. Um, the way you explained it about where you put the seeds in the Mid-Atlantic Seed Bank for, you know, was phenomenal. And then 
something we I never even heard of, and I'm sure a lot of people here haven't heard of is um, the I, and it's a new vocabulary word for me. Let me tell me if I get this right. It's a uh, rec. Recalcitrant, recalcitrant seeds. <laughs> yeah. Rec recalcitrant seed. Yeah. And that actually was new to me as well. I've, I've been ecologist for, you know, uh, more than a decade and, and into native plants since the early 1990s. Wow. I had never heard that word either. So don't feel bad about that. Yeah, um, no, no, I'm yeah. very excited that <laughs> we, we need these new words. We, we, because yes. it's always the same information that keeps coming over and over again. And, and I'm really excited about all of the new information that you you gave us. And, and I never even heard of founder plots, you know, for these types of seeds. And that's, that's great. And that's really wonderful. And along with that, we got a lot of really wonderful questions. And, um, and so I'm going to start with, I started grouping them all because a lot of them were, uh, you know, had the same kind of category. So let's start with the invasive species because you know that's such a problem and my the favorite one i'm going to ask first is about the spotter and lantern fly and the reason why i'm going to ask this one is because when i i my first citizen scientist project was with the new york new jersey trail conference spotting the spotted lantern fly like you know getting on iNaturalist and 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 surveying them so the question is, um, how can we stop the spotted lantern flies in our forest? And then the second part of that question is, how bad can they be for our trees? Mm. Okay, I'm not sure I have the answer to either one of those questions. Um, how about really bad? <laughs> That's a good enough, good enough answer, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, two years ago, I was uh, part of a team that was doing the early detection wrapper response for spot lanternfly in New York before it had arrived in New York. And it arrived in New York while I was in that position. And we threw everything we could at the, the populations that showed up and we were able to suppress them, but we weren't able to entirely eliminate them. And one of the problems is there's a lot of travel of people and goods from heavily infested areas to yeah. uninfested areas. And there's, without like sealing the border and having inspections of everything, every single thing that's coming through, you know, th those, those, they're going to keep coming. And I, what I liken it to is a forest fire and we're there stamping out the embers on the leading edge of the forest fire, but the forest fire is going to get there. Yeah. And by stamping out those embers, you can buy some time, mm -hmm. which may be helpful in allowing the science to figure out a way to deal with it. So yeah. I do know there's a lot of researchers that are looking at this and there is some promise in fungi that attack the spy lanternfly um, oh, that are, are not, I, I think they're even found naturally in, in our ecosystem, um, but that it's not a commercial project yet. And mm -hmm. so if you can buy a few more years uh, by you know stamping out those populations or trying to prevent the spread, stamping out the, the little infestations that happen, maybe you can buy some time for the science to figure out a solution that will not get rid of them, but suppress them enough uh, to allow our, our natural areas to survive. And can you explain to everybody how they impact, because you know how they defecate on the leaves and it blocks the photosynthesis, you know what I mean? The photosynthesis. Yeah. And, yeah. So yes, yeah, so it's by lantern flies, um, they're like a giant aphid uh, in terms of their effect. They, they excrete honeydew and they're big, they're about an inch long. So they excrete a lot of honeydew. So it's like a lot of sticky sap that ends up over everything underneath the trees and areas where they're hanging out. And then that, uh, because it's sugary and sticky, it starts to mold. And um, that happens when they infest trees in the understory, uh, the, the un, I'm sorry, when they infest the trees, the understory becomes covered with this sticky sap and black mold 
uh, because, and because it's covering the leaves, it can suppress the uh, photosynthesis. What's not known is the long-term effect. Um, you know, does it just suppress the population of the, the vegetation? Uh, can they survive it? Uh, does it have population effects? Uh, it's, it's little too soon. I'm not an expert on this uh, and I'm not keeping up with the current research. Um, yeah. I do know within a few days ago, there was a spy lantern fly uh, conference. Um, so I would encourage you to look at Penn State. It okay. seems to be leading the, the research effort to find out exactly what effects are that, that we might expect. Thank you. That's a, that was a really good answer. Um, I, and even more than we expected. So we really appreciate that. It was, I, um, so what is the invasive uh, plants that seem to be doing the most harm? In our region, the most widespread and prevalent invasive plants are um, uh, Japanese barberry and Japanese stilt grass. Um, oh. Though I'm, I'm not going to necessarily talk about harm, but those are the most widespread and um, and most prevalent in our parks. Even the parks that are very lightly invaded have mm -hmm. those. In terms of harm of invasive species, typically the forest pest insects do the most harm because they can wipe out whole species that are key to the ecosystem, um, mm -hmm. like the American chestnut or yeah, the yeah. elm or the hemlock, which have all disappeared from our area, or well, not disappeared, but really, really drastically reduced, as well as uh, the ash trees. Uh, so those are the ones I think that have like really the most effect. Yeah, um, yeah like blights and, and bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because they can, yeah, even the hazelnut, American hazelnut was taken out by a blight and Rutgers is working on trying to restore mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. And, you know, and, you know, it's funny you say the Japanese barberry because I remember during my inter internship for my uh, Rutgers environmental stewardship certification, I, one of my jobs was uh, surveying the trails, you know, and um, for invasive species. And I remember I was out at Watch Chung, uh, per, preservation, I think they call it. And I was on the trail and I, it was like, it was just Japanese barberry as far as I can see as the understory of the forest. And it was just felt like Armageddon to me. It was like the end of the world. There was no understory, no food, just invasive species endlessly. And it was just really, really heartbreaking. But if you don't have the education or the the knowledge you just look out there and say oh look at this nice green lush forest you know you don't and it's actually a food desert and it was really heartbreaking um and so let me see there's another one hey uh, is okay here's the here's another one is planting a foreign ecotype equivalent to planting an invasive so if an ecotype it doesn't belong in that eco region yeah, no, it's not really because invasive carries with its definition that it does harm. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, typically invasive is going to spread rapidly and do harm. There is potentially that a foreign ecotype could do something like that. Um, in terms of its genetics, it could swamp out uh, the genetics, but that's more of a very subtle differentiation, you're still yeah. going to have that species. It just may, diff may be different genes of the species. So I'd say that invasive is definitely much more harmful um, than a foreign ecotype. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the foreign ecotype because there is this question here about native ours. And, um, and can, you, can you explain the argument against native ours? Um, the question is, let me ask, let me find that question again. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk about it. I don't know if it's a specific thing. I talk a little bit about native ours. Yeah, so, because we were against native ours. Yeah. Can, you, well, can you explain the, how they can actually be harmful to the 
genetics of the, you know, the well, a, a, a native var is a, a selection of a native plant. And yeah. it's a human chosen selection right. for something that we want, whether it's a bigger flower, a different color, uh, or, or, or longer bloom period. Uh, it almost always does not take into account what the, the natural community needs, what the, right. the animals and insects that use that plant need. So by using or doing, using a native R, you're risking having the characteristics of that plant that is needed by the pollinators and insects that use it eliminated by our selection. Um, yeah. You're just risking that. You don't know that it may have happened um, in, unless you test that. One thing that has been found in some cases is that the native R or the native version, the, the selected version of the native that is in the landscape industry has less nectar in it or, yeah. or is less desirable to the pollinators or, or something like that. So that's what you're risking with the native Rs. Um, and that we don't deal with native Rs because we are using wild seed, wild collected populations. Right. And um, I think, yeah, I think the question was something about what the benefits of the native Rs are. There's really no benefit. To it. It's more of a risk. No, than a benefit. I wouldn't say there's no benefit. There, there can be benefits. Okay. It's just that it's it's very risky. Yeah. And you know, in cases where if you're in New York City in the middle of an urban area, it's better than not having any native plant at all. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, so there there are some cases where you know it's not really an issue. Um, you know, so I I, I don't deal with native ours. I'm not an expert. So I, I think I'd like to just leave the answer there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I mean, that was a really good, you explained it really well. Um, and okay, so somebody said she's working with a local park to remove invasive buckthorn. Uh, the woods are full of dead ash. Um, she says, if we decide to do some replanting, how do you suggest we go about choosing trees to replace the ash? Bio, um, bio region information. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right, so, sure so you... as I would expect, uh, I would uh, recommend uh, looking at your ecotype, looking at your eco region, and mm -hmm. looking okay. at the communities that are found there. So that will give you the palette of plants to choose from. Next, I would look at ash trees are typically an early pioneer species. They come in early in a field um, and grow up. And so you're gonna wanna look for plants that could fill that same role, such as birch trees or maples uh, or cherries, uh, so that could fill the same role that are appropriate to the, eco the, um, the ecological community that is already there. Okay, and then let me see. Let me go through my questions again. Okay, so um, Gisela says, should the fallen ash be removed? <laughs> um, so the only reason to remove it is if it's going to be a hazard uh, that could potentially fall on a building or a person. Otherwise, you should leave it alone because it's habitat. Then somebody asked, um, what can we do to avoid spreading invasive worms from our properties to the restoration areas if we want to help grow plants on our properties? Okay, so we have a solution for that. Okay. Um, what we do is, um, you saw the size of our trays. We mm -hmm. have a second tray that goes underneath uh, and then uh, risers that go between the two trays. So yeah. there's an air gap. Yeah, and our so our volunteers are are never supposed to take our plant tray out and put it on the ground, um, and the soil that we use is is you know not contaminated. We're very careful with that. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of the restoration sites that we have planted in, we see 
uh, Asian jumping worms when we're doing the planting. It's all, they're already there. Yeah. Um, but we're very careful not to make, uh, not to grow plants, potted plants that have any contamination potential with Asian jumping worms. Um, there is also possibility, it depends on what species you're growing, uh, that you can do it bare root and wash the roots. So that, for example, woody plants, you can typically do them bare root, wash the roots off, and then you can be sure that you're not transferring the Asian jumping worms. Um, there's also biosecurity measures that you do. Make sure your shoes okay. are clean, um, right. that you don't have mud in the treads of your hiking boots, and make mm -hmm. sure your tools are clean, your shovels and everything mm -hmm. like that are yeah. clean before you go to the site. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that we also could do um, to make sure that we're not transmitting or spreading the Asian jumping worms or other potentially harmful pests. We don't know what else is in the soil. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting how you say about the shoes, like a lot of people don't think to clean the bottom of their shoes. And I remember when I was surveying invasive species, a, a lot of the invasives were near the beginning of the trail because the, the seeds were on people's shoes as they were walking in the trail. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, now, the next question is, oh yeah, now this one, you you already answered this question uh, and I'll just ask it to see if there's anything more that you wanna to add to it. Um, but what can you re recommend the best plants for planting in the end of story? You kind of touched on that when you talked about mm -hmm. the bar, you know, the invasive buckthorn um, question. So it, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't actually recommend best plants for planting generally. Mm -hmm. uh, you really need to look at what the community is that's going, that is there already. And you can see what the overstory canopy trees are. And there's mm -hmm. usually some evidence of native plants in that understory. And look at what the community should be. And that will give you the palette of plants to plant. And um, also someone asked, can you talk about what plants you are putting back into the woods? Yeah, right now what we are dealing with at Black Rock Forest is we did um, zigzag goldenrod, blue stem goldenrod, white wood aster, um, what else? Uh, couple some rough snake fruit, uh, though we're not doing too much of that. Uh, we also did um, Collinsonia canadense, which is uh, has various common names, uh, stone root and citronella horse balm are a couple of the common names. Um, we're also working on um, uh, several carex species, sedges, and mm -hmm. ferns. Um, ferns are going to take a while. We're growing them from spores. Uh, wow. So... Uh, yeah, that'll be... yeah, I mean, they're so tiny, the spores. But, have... yeah. yeah, and we do have uh, quite a bit of shrubs started. Uh, they're multi-year prospects uh, mm -hmm. in our area. Um, we're, we're doing um, linden, vibe, I mean, not linden, vibe, uh, we're doing um, uh, spice bush. Uh, oh. So the spice bush should be oh. ready. Um, the first yeah. batch of spice bush should be ready this year. Um, and we've started uh, some viburnums, uh, black haw viburnum and maple leaf viburnum. Uh, the viburnums are two-year germinators, so it's going to take a couple years before they germinate and then a couple more oh. years before they're big enough to put out. So, you mean you have to put them in the soil in two years after the seed is in the soil, they'll start to grow? Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't know that. I, are, aren't jack in the pulpits also two-year germinators? Uh, Possibly, I <laughs> that one memorized. I don't know, <laughs> um, but the the goldenrod that you said you're planting, I mean, according to Doug Tallamy, that's one of the keystone species as far as attracting butterflies, mm -hmm. and um, you know, in the fall. So that's fantastic yeah. too. Yeah, we also uh, did um, at Black Rock on a, more of an open slope. We did um, a silver rod, which is a, a white blooming goldenrod, and. Uh, oh, all of these species that we chose are already in the nearby areas of the forest. 
Um, yes. So we're, we're not introducing anything that's not nearby. Right. It must look so beautiful too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now let me see. It says recommendations on make or model of noun powered bulb uh, augers. Please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. We, we don't not is it say non powered. Yeah, non powered. Yeah. Um, I don't have the maker model memorized. Um, but uh, yeah, we we able we were able to buy some from um, a we just looked up bulb planting augers on Google, okay. you'll find a lot of selections, but we were able to buy some from Amazon as well. The main thing is, we use the the hand press so it's basically the old-fashioned drill so it has a knob yeah. up here and you turn it right so the main thing is to get the the slot or the, the stem of the auger that fits your your hand press right uh, okay so you got to make sure that you do that um you can also use augers with a battery powered drill um we found we have very rocky ground mm -hmm. and we found it's much better to manually do it because when you hit a rock you stop whereas right. the, the drill keeps going and it wrenches your auger and can strip it oh. you know? so um yeah. yeah yeah so we 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 don't and you know when we're doing it manually we don't run out of battery power yeah so. that's right. <laughs> you know just get a little tendonitis but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um let me see now this one this question that you you pretty well covered it, but just in case you have anything uh, good to add to it, I'm curious. It's curious about your source of seed for local ecotypes, and you probably you know you explain really well yeah. how you get your seeds and yeah we we collect from local wild populations. Um, yeah, we don't buy it. Um, we we collect from local wild populations, and there are other organizations in the area that are um, doing the same kind of thing uh, for other reasons. Uh, occasionally we will trade seed with them, uh, people that we know and trust that they are keeping the provenance of the seed yeah. and they've responsibly collected it. And the provenance again is the um, GPS in the area. Yeah. And um, now this question, how can regular people at home be able to store seeds? And the second part of that question is how long can seeds be stored in the facility? Um, in the seed bank, the, they can be stored indefinitely, but okay. it does depend on your species, how long that seed can remain viable. Okay. Every species has their own length of time. It can remain viable in storage. And yes, you can store it at home in a refrigerator. Um, you know, you can, I've seen uh, groups that use just like a, the dorm type of refrigerator that you get for a dorm yeah. room. Yeah, and that's where you store your seeds um, mm -hmm. or in the, the lettuce drawer in your refrigerator. You know, yeah. my, my husband did that for a while. He's like, I open it up like, that's not vegetables. <laughs> Seeds. <laughs> close. It's close. It's yeah. <laughs> some of them you can eventually eat once they grow. There, I'm, I'm sure some of them will be edible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, look at that URL that I put up there about uh, uh, what was it? Wild seeds from uh, wild plants from seeds URL. They it typically says what it, how it can be stored. And um, here's a good one. What is your preferred potting mix soil for growing these native plant <laughs> seedlings? I want that question, I, that answer too. Yeah, I want that answer too. <laughs> I, I, my preferred potting soil is not, it's like a fantasy right now. <laughs> I do not have an actual one that I can buy that is a yeah. preferred one. Um, you know, we, when we started last year, we're a brand new organization. We had no funding. For us, the, the cheapest soil we could buy was what we had to get okay. because we couldn't afford anything else. Uh, yeah. We want to be sustainable. We, we want to do things in the most sustainable way we can. 
And so we prefer not to be using peat. We prefer not to be using chemicals in our soil. Um, you know, we prefer to be organic. Uh, we prefer to be even making our own soil if we knew how and if we had the capability. Um, mm -hmm. we, we've looked at things like coconut core, uh, which a lot of people are going to, or rice fulls. Where do those come from? I know we don't have coconuts in this area. You've got right. transportation costs with that. Exactly. Uh, we don't have rice growers in this area. There's there's transportation costs with that. So that's mm -hmm. not really sustainable either. So yeah, um, I don't have an, a good answer yet. I'm still looking. Um, if you yeah, know right. something, you know, please share. You know. <laughs> well, I I just I have pet rabbits, and so I'm very always very grateful of their droppings because they go into my dirt and I'm hoping that that will help my potting soil <laughs> you know it's like well, this uh, natural natural uh fertilizer <laughs> yeah yeah and and my bunny Binks she's like the top producer because she has the biggest ones yeah <laughs> um and you know and it's and there is a question here about peat moss like why avoid peat moss and you just you just mentioned that so it's perfect segue into that question okay Peat moss is mined from peat bogs in Canada and destroys an ecosystem. Peat is also one of the best carbon storage, uh, mm. you know, natural carbon storage areas. So if you're destroying a peat bog and you're taking peat out of the, the swamp and, and using it, um, you're impacting that. And, and I, I would prefer not to do that. Yeah, and and peat is a type of yeah. I mean, it's moss, and moss is moss and lichens are um, carbon sequestering superpowers. I actually just wrote an article about that for Wild Ones newsletter, and you're you know I that would be a huge loss if you remove all of that. I can completely see that. Um, okay, so now here's a question: uh, Do you use cuttings for propagating? I mean, propagation of shrubs. Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, mm. If you buy shrubs uh, or sometimes even some trees, uh, typically they're from cuttings and often they're clones because those cuttings are from the same individual. Right. And right. so, but the reason they do that is because it's easy to make a big plant faster by right. these cuttings, right? So we're looking at that because in our forests, one of the primary components in our forests is low bush blueberry and also huckleberry. And those take a really long time to grow from seed. So can we do cuttings in a way that preserves genetic diversity? And what we're looking at, we, we don't really have a scientist to work, at, work with on this, but we figure if we collect a few cuttings from multiple different populations and multiple different individuals, that we can have genetic diversity in our group of cuttings. Um, so that's what we're going to try. We're going to try, you know, doing like you know, multiple individual cuttings from this population, go to another one, multiple individual cuttings. Uh, and when I say individual cuttings, I mean from different individuals in that population. Yeah, yeah and different areas so so that we at least have some genetic diversity and we can still produce large and large plants larger plants more quickly yeah and um i remember when i was volunteering at uh rutgers um hazelnut tree project um they would have they would they would be very careful not to give me a like a duplicates from the same cutting because they have to cross pollinate yeah, and that you can't cross pollinate with the same plant, you know what I mean? And so, um, do you also consider that with, is is that also an issue with the blueberries and huckleberries? Yeah, blueberries uh, fruit better when they come from different varieties when you're buying commercial plants. So I'm sure it would be similar with native plants. Uh, I mean, wild plants. Um, yeah, but I think our our method of doing it will will make it so that we don't have to be concerned about that because we're collecting from a, a, a large, big area. Yeah, a large variety in a big area. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now it says, do your volunteers water the plants a couple of times after planting? Yes. 
<laughs> that's why that's why they well, take them, right? Because there's so, a bunch of water yeah, in them. We, you know? we would love for that to happen. Um, and we do ask for volunteers that, that want to do that. But one of the nice things about planting in the fall, especially in our area, um, round about September is when we start getting the rains from remnant hurricanes that yeah. come into this area. So we get some good soaking rains in September, usually a few times throughout the month. And then October rolls around and the plants go dormant. Yeah. And they're dormant all winter. And then they come in the spring, usually the spring's wet enough. And so they've got a really good start. They get watered in naturally. They go through the winter. Usually there's moisture in the winter. Usually there's moisture in the spring. So they get a good time to put down roots before they might have to deal with a drought in the summer. Okay. And so, so mainly, do you give, when the, do the volunteers take the plants from you all throughout the year or do you usually have certain times of the year when they come and take the plants home? Uh, they, they get the plants right after the potting up work days. So that's usually okay. in June uh, or early July. Okay, yeah, so for sure during those summer months, they have to water them and take good care yeah. of them. Yeah, Yeah. I think the question though meant after they're planted. Oh, in the yeah. restoration site. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. And um, then it says, can you please share information on screw style hole digging tool? I think, <laughs> can, wasn't that the, isn't that what you just talked about earlier? Like yeah. the, yeah. yeah. Oh, whether okay. I could, uh, I can try looking it up real quickly if you want to look for the next question. And I okay. will. Uh... You can ask me the next question. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah, I've got it. I was just waiting for you. Okay. Um, it Go says, ahead. any other advice for people wanting to start something like this in another area of USA? And uh, how can we help expand this project? Um, you can help expand the project uh, by donating to us or volunteering for us uh, if you're local. Um, yeah, we're, like I said, we're just limited in the number of volunteers we have and the costs of our, of our supplies. Mm -hmm. um, so. But if somebody is in another state and they want to, um expand what you're doing kind of mm -hmm. in the United States oh, and they, if they'd like to do it too yeah yeah um I mean have at it uh, <laughs> uh so I mean I would I would recommend that you uh really follow good protocols um that you look at the seeds of success protocols about for seed collecting uh, that you develop a, a permission slip for landowners to get permission to collect from. And the, you know, it's, it's not a, a quick process. You have right. to scout for populations. You have to wait for them to set seed. You have to collect that seed. You have to sow the seed, wait for it to germinate. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of prep work you can do to get prepared without even having any volunteers, without even any growing plants. You know, you, you can find your populations. And iNaturalist is a free uh, app that's available. You can record all those populations there and, mm -hmm. um, you know, prepare that way and get your permits lined up, uh, start collecting, figure out where you're gonna store your seed, figure out how to clean the seed. Before you start growing plants, Figure out where your restoration sites are and what plant species you need. Okay, because right. you know that was one of the things we didn't really have a the luxury of doing that because we needed to get started. So we sowed a bunch of plants that we thought were generally, you know, they're they're widespread species. They're generally useful in the forest, and so those are what we sowed to grow. And then we found the restoration sites for them. Um, yes. I, it's it that was sort of cart before the horse. You need to find your restoration sites first, find out what species should be there, and then go look for populations to collect the seed from for those species for that site. And, um, let me see. 
So hey, someone wants a little history here. So it says, would love to know more about the history of seed collecting in our area. Uh, do you know if the native communities from New York and New Jersey used to do similar seed collecting practices? It's okay um, if you have the history on that. <laughs> well, I do know the Greenbelt Native Plant Center, which is based in uh, Staten Island, they're the, the nursery for New York City. Um, they've been collecting local native plant seeds for a few decades. I don't know exactly how long, but it's at least a few decades and growing them for use in New York City planting projects for the New York City parks. Do you have um, a link? Oh, Greenbelt Native Plant Center. Okay, um, um, maybe Haley can write it down for us yeah. and put it in the in the chat. But they're they're funded by New York City Parks, so their purpose is to grow and pro provide plant materials for New York City Parks, and okay. they've been collecting from about a hundred mile range. 100, 100 mile circular range uh, out of New York City um, and storing excess seed in the Mid-Atlantic Seed Bank, which is co-located there at the at Greenbelt Native Plant Center. So that's and as much of history as I know. I know Pinelands Nursery in Southern New Jersey does local collections. Mm -hmm. um, I know Wild Ridge Nursery in Northwestern New Jersey uh, does local collections. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of the extent of my knowledge of the history. But that's, that's excellent though, it's really good, thank you. Um, now it says, uh, oh, I think this is the last question here. Um, would Wildwoods consider starting an Instagram for their efforts? We would love to support them on that platform. Oh, we must have some young people here. <laughs> I've I've gotten that request. I, I have trouble just keeping up with the Facebook um, and, right? and putting posts. You know, we're we're volunteer. You know, right. it's all volunteer, and we just started last year. And keeping up with a an Instagram, you know, I I I'm just not there yet. Oh, um, hopefully you know. if we had more money to fund like maybe an intern that would take care of the the communications that would be great well maybe um, an, even a volunteer, volunteer. yeah, yeah. any yeah. volunteers hey, out there good at Instagram right if please, anybody wants to volunteer hand. for that i would love that yes um. <laughs> <laughs> we would too and i think i think that's it that's all the questions um okay i I don't see anything more. If there is anything more, please, anyone, uh, Gisela or Haley, anybody jump in with one if there was something I missed. But I, I really appreciate you answering those. You did such a great job and you were very thorough. And um, now I'm going to hand it over to our, um, our board member, uh, Carol, and she's going to come on next, I, I believe, for the closing statements, perhaps, if I'm mm -hmm. correct. That in, but anyways, so I'll, I'll see you guys later. I'm just waiting for uh, Haley to make the switch for us. There's Carol. Thank you, Carol. Hello. Bye. Hi. Thank you so much, Linda. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, hello again, everyone. Um, certainly, we want to thank Linda for this Anoint Me uh, seminar, and we hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, as you've probably been watching, Haley has been putting in all the critical links into the chat um, for both uh, Linda's nonprofit and for Wild Ones. Um, but there are links in there for um, our YouTube channel, which the recording from tonight will be archived, um, our newsletter mailing list, and also the link to Wild Ones website where you could become a member of your local Wild Ones chapter. Um, but please remember to follow uh, Wild Ones New Jersey Gateway on Facebook and Instagram um, for news and information about future uh, events and webinars that we have planned. Um, and again, thank you for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining.
Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. You did fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm adding in the chat just in case anybody else wants to donate or sign up for the Wildwoods um, newsletter as well. It's in the chat. Thank you. Totally guys. recommend it. Bye. Have a good night. Uh -oh.